since my scripture reader isn't um, feeling well, and this has some names that are hard to pronounce, I'm just going to do scripture. It's from Isaiah 36, verse 2 and verse 4, and then I'm going to read from Mark 9, 49 and 50, and then Malachi 3, 2, which you didn't have, Kim. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field, the field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? From Mark, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? And from Malachi 3, 2, But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's soap and a launderer's so- a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. So if you'll bow with me in prayer. <laughs> Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the privilege that we have to come and worship you, that your word is available to us. Lord, may we read it, may we study it, may we hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. May the Spirit guide us into all truth, Lord, so that we learn more and more about Jesus and your amazing love and this great plan of salvation that you have presented for us, that we can dwell in your midst, not just here on earth, but we're seated in the heavenly realms with Christ, our Savior. And we long for the day that He returns, Lord. Fill us with your Spirit so that we may walk this this world the way Jesus would walk this world, to be His hands and feet, to love you and love one another. And we just long for the day that when we meet him face to face, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So if you haven't been reading, you should, because that's what I'm talking about again. If you don't have a devotional, they're down there. You should have read this week chapters 23 to 38 from Isaiah and Mark chapter 6 and 9. And I entitled this message, Fire and Soap, Salt and Water. And that make a little more sense as we go through everything. Our devotion started this week with justice is satisfied. God's justice, His wrath was poured out on His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus did all of that. The New Covenant, the New Testament is here, written in the blood of Jesus. It's unconditional. It cannot be changed. If you believe in faith that Jesus Christ is who He says He is, that He is God, that He is Lord, that He died for your sins, and you repent of your sins and turn to Him, you will be saved. Nothing can ever take that from you. Nothing can ever harm you in any form or fashion. It is not in God's will. And death is just a passing into eternal life. The next thing after that, um, and, and Jesus did that while we were still His enemies. He took all of God's wrath. Justice is satisfied. The next devotions went through times in our life that we don't feel that way though that we struggle with things that are happening to us, that we are afraid, that we fear what men might say, that we don't think we're good enough. Whatever those things are, I'm just mentioning many different things. Those devotions should have spoke to you. I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 2. Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus. Starting in verse 1, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live. That means you used to live that way. As in there's a change now. You don't live that way anymore. And you're not dead in your transgressions and sins. You did this when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And you read so much about kings and kingdoms, and I've preached on that before, that you do serve one king and work for his kingdom, or you serve another king and work for his kingdom. It depends on who your king is. You do pledge allegiance to that king by the things that you do and do not do with your life. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Verse 3, all of us used to live among them at one time. We gratified the cravings of our flesh and followed the desires and thoughts. So we should think that we should live differently than that now. Like the rest then, we were by nature deserving God's wrath. But justice has been satisfied, right? Jesus paid the price. Verse 4, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. We're not dead anymore. We're alive. We've been born again to live anew for Christ Jesus in this world. He did this even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He did this, verse 7, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by work so that you cannot boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I like reading the NLT because it says we're God's masterpiece. We're this creation that God has created at the beginning of time and is now molding us to be His children because we rebelled and sinned against God. But even while we were in our sins and transgressions, God's enemies, Christ died for us. What a wonderful, amazing salvation, amazing grace. How can we not live differently? How can we not tell others of this? So does this apply to you? Are you God's child? Now you've got to consider what we read about Israel in the past, and we jumped several thousand years, a couple thousand years. We jumped from Genesis, and we jumped all the way to Isaiah, and we've got to remember that there's Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. <laughs> there's all this time in there, and we've seen this history of mankind which continues to rebel against God, they profess Him with their lips, but their hearts are far from Him. Oh, boy, when I read, I don't know about you, but I do some real serious self-examination. And I ask God to examine my heart and expose these things in my heart that are keeping me from serving Him with all of my heart. Any other loves I have, any idols I have, so that I can wipe that clean. And we're going to talk more about that as we talk through Isaiah. Consider how they lived, that they didn't set themselves apart what their faith and confidence was grounded on, the witness that they proclaimed. And we see so many times in reading through Isaiah that the pagan nations gave God more respect than, than Israel did at times. The devotions for the weeks, weeks continued with these messages. How God protected Joseph, even though many times it seemed like God wasn't there and God didn't care. Does that sound familiar? How Paul was in prison, but that imprisonment led him to, to write to Timothy and to the other churches to tell them to not be ashamed. Because even this imprisonment was advancing the gospel in the walls of the, of the prison. And look, it's still being spoken today in the New Testament, the Word of God. It is a privilege and an honor to suffer for the gospel. We are God's possession created by Him and redeemed by Christ. We are not our own. We are to worship God and don't take lightly the gift of prayer that we have. Look at how prayerfully dependent Jesus was. Look at His example and think, uh, think on the way that He taught us to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Give us daily bread so that we can be satisfied, so that we can be provided by You and not seek the things of this world, but seek the Creator of this world. We are His children and He wants to provide for us. So let us really mean your kingdom come and your will be done. That's kind of summing up the different devotions real quickly, but kind of summing up what was there each week. And the things that we face in life that cause us to not do the things that we should, to not see our Heavenly Father that way, to doubt, to seek our own wills and our own desires, to serve another kingdom rather than His kingdom and push that agenda rather than our own because we're not proclaiming the gospel message and living the way we should. Oh, Jacob, what a deceiver you are. Why can't we understand that we're Israel? Why can't we understand that we're God's child? Why can't we understand that we're redeemed and blessed and that we're supposed to live like Christ in this world? So if judgment is coming on sin, and it was in Isaiah's day, then how should you be living now? And if you're not living that way, shouldn't you repent? Shouldn't you tell of God's love, His mercy, and His grace? Shouldn't you live to, to love God and serve Him and to love others? If your salvation is a reality, if it's more price, priceless to you and precious than, to you than anything, and Jesus commissions you and gives you the authority to spread the good news, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and will give you the words that you don't even know to say when those times come, then are you living that way? If your faith and hope are in Jesus Christ and in nothing else, shouldn't we live a set-apart holy life and be satisfied with God's provision of daily bread? 
then why did Israel and the church live like the world instead of living like God's children? Why does the church today live like the world rather than living like Jesus' hands and feet in this world? Thank goodness for God's remnant, those that are faithful, those that are His true legitimate children instead of illegitimate children. A day will come when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, and no matter if the goat thinks he's a sheep, looks like a sheep, if he's not a sheep, he will be separated. Isaiah 23, prophecy against all of the prosperous kingdoms that live in prostitution in this world, living for someone else, giving themselves for another love instead of God. Israel is supposed to proclaim God's love to the nation so that they would see the God of Israel and worship Him not worship idols. Isaiah 24, verse 1, See, the Lord is going to lay waste to the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for the priests as for the people, for the master as for the servant, for the mistress as for her servant, for the seller as for the buyer, for the borrower as for the lender, for the debtor as for the collector. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 1. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things planned long ago. Verse 6 of Isaiah 25. On the mountain the Lord Almighty was preparing a feast of rich foods for all people, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and of, of finest wines. On the mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all the people, the sheets that cover all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all the faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord your God has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So what or whom do you trust in? And remember these verses that I just read to me from Isaiah because the king of Babylon says the same thing basically when he tells Israel to bow down to him. What things he will provide for them. So many in this world rely on the government and rely on other things to provide for them instead of God. And don't give God the thanks and the glory and the honor and the worship that he, that he deserves. Isaiah chapter 26. Let us sing a song of praise to God. We should just burst out in song because we are so joyful for this great salvation that God is preparing for us in heaven. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 2, In that day sing about a fruitful vineyard. The Lord, <clears throat> I the Lord watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. I am not angry if only there were briars and thorns confronting me. I would march against them in battle. I would set them all on fire. Or else let them come to me for refuge. Let them make peace with me. Yes, let them make peace with me. In the days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Has the Lord struck her as he struck down those who struck her? Has she been killed as those, who, as those were killed who killed her? By warfare, war, warfare and exile, you contend with her. With his fierce blast, he drives her out, as on a day the east wind blows. By this, then, will Jacob's guilt be atoned for, and this will be the full fruit of the removal of her sin. When he makes all the altar stones to be like limestone, crushes the, crushed to pieces, no asher poles or incense altars will be left standing. How many idols... How many Asherah poles are in your life? How many things do you love that compete with God? Where is your faith? Where is your hope? Where is your confidence? Isaiah 28, 29, 31, 32, 33 all talk about woes. Isaiah 28, woe to the leaders who lead to other people astray. Isaiah 29, woe to the cities that live for their own evil desires. Isaiah 30, woe to obstinate children. Verse 1, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, not my will be done, but mine. Because I'm a selfish, spoiled little brat who doesn't want the Father's will to be done instead of my own. 
You know what happens when my grandkids do that? That's why they call me Pops. <laughs> why can't we see how much God loves us and wants for us? Why can't we see that we belong in heaven, that we are seated with, heaven, with Jesus Christ in heavenly realms right now? Why cannot we not see that we are aliens and foreigners in this world? Why can, I, can we not see that He cares for the birds of the field? How much more does He love us? You know, it would make all these things that we look, read about in those devotions a lot easier, wouldn't it? When we cry out, why is this happening to me? I can't do this, anything else. If God is with me, who is against me? <clears throat> to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin. Isaiah 31, woe to those kingdoms that we put our faith and trust and hope in them. We get drunk off their wine, but Babylon will be destroyed. Isaiah 32, instead, put your faith, trust, and hope in the king of righteousness. I know his name, do you? There is no name above any other name but Jesus Christ, my Savior and my Lord. Verse 33, we've got another woe. Woe to those who destroy and betray people and God. Instead, call for help. Verse 2 of Isaiah 33, Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. Call and God will answer you. Verse 14 of Isaiah 33, Who of us can dwell with, this, with the consuming fire? Sounds a lot like the verse I read from Malachi this morning. Who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? Those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes, who stop their, stop their ears against plots of murder and shut their, their eyes against contemplating evil. Verse 16, they are the ones who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be in the mountain fortress. Their bread will be supplied and water will not fail them. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. Isaiah chapter 34. All nations heed God's warning to repent and turn to him before destruction comes. Isaiah 35. Faith and hope in God alone makes you rejoice, 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 because you are redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. So call on God. Verse 3, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sands will become a pool, the thirsty grounds bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will journey on it, will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. Well, it sounds like there's only one path to go on, isn't it? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. He said, it is better for me to leave you so that the Holy Spirit will come and can guide you into all truth. He will be with you forever. As you read God's Word, He will write those words upon your heart. As you walk in step with the Spirit, doing the gifts that the Spirit gives you, doing the things that Jesus did in this world, the more that it, you will become like Christ each and every day. And you will bring God's kingdom here to earth. You will be doing His will. You will find peace and joy. You will find food for your soul and water for your soul. You will be blessed. You are blessed. Do you realize that? See, a child that lives as a child doesn't understand what the parents are trying to do for the child if they have a good set of parents, if they have a good father. And we let them go through some of the things they go through to teach them, don't we? 
So the temptations and trials that you're facing, is, as the New Testament tells us repeatedly, they build perseverance and strength so that you can say that God was with you the whole way. I think most all of you have seen that where the lady cries out and says, where were you when I was walking and I only saw the one set of footprints in the sand? That's when He was carrying you. If my child cried out to me, there's no way I would not pick him up, hold him in my loving arms. He's too big now to hold in my arms, but you know what I mean. So I'll use a grandkid <laughs> and take care of them because of how much I love them. My love does not compare at all to God's love who would give his one and only son to die for you so that you might live for him and live eternally. So we have an example coming up. Hezekiah. We've got a good king. Well, let me re re rewind a little bit. We've had numerous years of judges and kings and, and good and bad and times that, that people were trusting the Lord and times that idols filled the land. And this, this cycle goes on and on. It's, it's man's history. But God's history, His story, is that we're supposed to live for Him and because of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living in us, I cannot imagine what Hezekiah would say about us here today. Or what Joseph would say, or what David would say, or what Abraham would say. Because God dwells with us. So we have an example of Hezekiah, and his name literally means Jehovah is my strength. He's a good king, he's a leader, a, uh, a good leader, he's from the line of David, but he's still a man. He still fights this battle, he still fights this struggle, just like David did, but David was a man after God's own heart because when that sin was confronted to him, he went straight to God and asked for forgiveness and he changed direction. When he strayed off that way of holiness and it was brought to his attention, he, ch he repented, asked God for forgiveness and asked God to put him back on that right way. Hezekiah was a good leader and he stripped the lands of the Asherah poles and the idols and everything, but he made one little mistake and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Isaiah 36, verse 1, In the fourteenth year of Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, his name interestingly means sin, moon, and increases brothers. I don't know how you put that all together except, let's see, if we continue to sin, especially sins as big as the moon, all we're going to do is spread that infectious sin to everybody else instead of being a light to the world like we're supposed to be, right? Okay, that's my explanation. <laughs> In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Now let's think back a little bit and rewind a little bit. Okay, there was this guy named Jonah that didn't want to go to Nineveh, the, Babylon, the capital of Babylon, because those people were so evil, and he was afraid that they might repent and turn to God. And he went with an eight-word message, and they repented, truly repented and turned to God. But now 100, 150 years has happened, and they forgot about God again. That's why we have to continue to be a light every single day and write the, the laws of God on our hearts and tell them about our ch to our children when we get up, when we go to bed, when we're lying around doing nothing, when we're eating, everything else. We write those laws and we live the way that children of God are supposed to live so that they see us, so that they'll tell their children and their grandchildren so that a hundred years from now God's not gone out of this country. Oh, that's today, isn't it? King of Assyria attacked the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Laetius to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the com commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. That's what we read this morning, right? Okay, that's a lot of words there. and it Seems like maybe just a random place, but it's not. <clears throat> Elakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary. Can I just go S and stuff? Like S, the secretary? I'm going to try it anyway. And Joah, son of Asheph, the recorder, went out to him. The field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king of Assyria says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You, you say you have counsel and might for war. 
but you speak only empty words. Why would that be? Because I'm basing my confidence on my own might and my own strength, right? On whom, are we de- uh, on whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you are depending on Egypt. Oh, I went and made an alliance with another country instead of trusting God. That splintered reed of a staff which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And we've already been down that road in Egypt, and we saw what God did there, the mighty works that he did, to all who depend on him. Verse 7, But if you say this to me, we are depending on the Lord your God. Well, are you really depending on him, or have you put your trust in somewhere else? Are your lips professing, but is your heart far from him? Isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed? He did all that. But did Hezekiah clean out all the darkness? Did you clean out all the darkness? Have I cleaned out all the darkness? I know that I still have a lot of sweeping to do, and it's not me. It's walking in step with the Spirit so that God does it through me. He saved me, and He will make me like Christ as I yield to Him. There are still some things here that we see that Hezekiah did not remove. You must worship, but he removed saying to Judah and Jerusalem, You must worship before this altar. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How, the, how then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? Oh, wow. Now, that one, I had to sit and contemplate for a while. That if some of the times my enemies come against me, if they're actually coming in the Lord's name to bring me back to repentance, boy, I have a different picture then, don't I? (laughs) He uses whoever he uses to bring about his glory. Pharaoh could have turned at any time and and worshipped Jehovah God, but he didn't. I can turn at any time and get back on that path of righteousness. You can too. The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Wow. Now I'm going to take you back a few chapters in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, to meet Ahaz. Remember him? Okay, and why Isaiah went out to meet him to tell him the evil that he was doing. And meet him at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Wow, that's a coincidence. Or is it? I've got to think more about what this road is to the aqueduct of the upper pool. Oh, that provides water for the city to drink. And it's on the road on the way to the launderer's field where they wash their clothes so they can be white. Oh, yeah, okay. Back to Isaiah 36. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. Are we relying on the things of this world or are we relying on God to do this? Are we realizing that this world is a sinful, corrupt, fallen creation? And God is going to make everything new. Why would we put our hopes and dreams in a fallen creation when we could put our hopes and dream in heaven and work towards the kingdom of heaven and bringing it here on earth today? That only makes sense. Why would we go out and serve another king? Verse 17, Until I come and take you to this land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Isaiah 37. Whoa, you might want to go back and read that. You see true repentance. Hezekiah realizes that he has darkness that he needs to sweep away. That he swept away the Asherah poles and the altars and everything, but he still is relying on his own strength, his own might, his name, the treasures in the palace, whatever the things are, instead of trusting God. He made an alliance with Egypt. He had let his trust go down so far. And then his enemy comes against him in the Lord's name, not to destroy him, but to turn him back to God. True repentance brings true deliverance. Isaiah 37, this is what Hezekiah says. 
This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, as when children come to the moment of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore pray for the remnant that still survives. When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you've heard. Those words which the under, underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with a sword. And this is exactly what happens. Verse 36, Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib king of Israel broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, his son, I'm going to say Adam and Sher, which is what I'm going to do, not even going to try, killed him with a sword, and they escaped to the land of, of Ararat. And Esherashaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. God is in complete control. And we as His children are to proclaim His name and be a light to this world until He makes all things new. And Jesus Christ, if He is your Savior, He is your Lord. If He's not your Lord, He's possibly, very possibly not your Savior. Who are you trusting in? Did you come to Him in repentance but then walk away? And Paul writes, how have you quick, so quickly fallen? Jesus Himself writes to the church and says, Why have you fallen away from your first love? If you believe God has the power to save you, you repented from your sins and believed in Him, why do you believe He will not walk you all the way and complete the good work that He started in you and you into the masterpiece that He designed from all of the beginning of creation to do good works? If we let that deceiver whisper in our ear and bring seeds of doubt rather than trusting in God. So we need to read God's Word daily. We need to fellowship daily. We need to pray daily. And we need to repent when we find things that there need to be repentance for. Isaiah 38, that's where we finished our readings for this week. Live today while you still have the opportunity. Not live for the day, live for today to worship and honor God, to be like Jesus in this world, to rely on His might and His strength, to let Him transform you, which means, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, that we need to change the way that we think. We need to step apart from this world, and we need to trust in God and let the Spirit transform us. You don't know when your life will be required of you. If you have today, you better be breathing and living for God because you might not have tomorrow. Isaiah was a true prophet, and he told Hezekiah that he was going to die. That's the word God gave to him. God didn't change his mind. God knew all this, but he uses what he gives us. He gives us these little pieces of information. This was not a false prophecy from Isaiah. It was the truth. But because Hezekiah repented and prayed to God... God changed that and added 15 years to his life. So Isaiah didn't give a false prophecy. Follow that. Because that's some people say, well, the, Isaiah gave a false prophecy here. No, he didn't. Because the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Spend time praying for your children, for the sicknesses and diseases out there, for everything else. But make sure that you, you've examined your own heart and swept away the darkness so that you can be a light, not a deluded light. Hezekiah prayed, God answered him, and added 15 more years to his life. 15 more years to live and be an example and a good leader. To walk the way of holiness, the highway of holiness. If we go to 2 Kings, we'll read another little mistake that Hezekiah made prior. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 15, The prophet asked, What did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace. My palace. Hezekiah said, There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. You know, if he hadn't done that years ago, maybe Babylon wouldn't have been knocking at his door that day. 
Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Now I want to remind you what the son of thunder who became the, the, God, the disciple of love wrote in 1 John chapter 1. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. And do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with, with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Scripture doesn't stop there. The next word is if we claim to be out sin, we de without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Hezekiah did not do that. He confesses sins. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, you know the rest, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse or purify us from all unrighteousness, to cleanse us clean. Oh, the launderers who... We don't have to worry about washing our own garments to get to heaven. All we need to do is put on Jesus as they're pure white. Every stain has been taken away. You are redeemed. You are a child of God. You are blessed. You are beloved by God Almighty. He is your Father who you can turn to at any point in time. Turn to Him. So what would you do for 15 more years? 15 more healthy years. Let me throw that in there because some of you are like, I want 15 more years. <laughs> Fifteen more healthy years. Would you live them for the things of this world? Or would you live them for God? If He asked you today, would, you said you kept all the commandments, and then He said, but one thing you lack, sell everything and give it to the poor and follow Me. Would you do that? Or would you walk away? I don't know what He would ask of you. I don't even know what He would ask of me at this point. But I would like to say that there is nothing that would stop me from following Him, period. So I have to walk every day in His Word. I have to study. I have to pray. I have to pray for others. I have to be a light to them. I have to pray for my children and for my grandchildren. I have to tell them about the Lord, and I have to live in such a way that I am not a hypocrite. Life is hard. Satan wants to see, deceive you to get you off track, whether it's a burden or trial in your life or whether it's just complacency or success, whatever it is. Stay focused on the kingdom and kingdom ministry. Mark chapter 6. Many heard about Jesus, but not many really listened, did they? Jesus sends out His disciples, and John the Baptist is beheaded in really a game. Who would think in that day that this was how things were going to turn out. But God is in complete control. Jesus offers the crowds bread, and they accept physical bread, but they don't want the bread of life. The disciples see all this, and yet they're still scared of some wind and some waves. Now, if you didn't read Mark chapter 6, you're not really going to know what I'm talking about there. But I'm talking about the feeding of the 5,000, I'm talking about Jesus walking on water to the disciples. Okay? Mark chapter 7, you hypocrite. What defiles you? Verse 6, as Isaiah prophesied, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. And the faith of a pagan woman and the faith of a pagan Deaf man, because these are outside of Israel. They're in Tyre and Sidon, of all places. <laughs> Heals them. The woman is healed from her diseases, and the deaf man is given hearing and speech and proclaims the word of God, that Jesus is who he says he is. Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds another multitude. Will fi fi people finally see that he's the bread of life and follow him instead? Well, not the religious for sure. So Jesus warns His disciples to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, those who profess Him with their lips, but their hearts aren't far from Him because it's an infectious disease like a cancer that spreads everywhere before the whole body has it and dies. 
Instead, we need to spread love, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. Any other way leads to death. But following and trusting in Jesus brings true life. So in Mark chapter 9, we see Jesus transformed before Peter's very own eyes. He had proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah and had the words of life. And then when Jesus and Peter come off the mountaintop, and of course James and John are there with him, Jesus is angered because the disciples that were down there while he was up on the mountaintop wasn't doing the work that they should have been doing. A father brought his son to the, to the did I say church or disciples? Ah, we'll use either one brought his son to those who professed to know Jesus and they could not heal him. And this angered Jesus because he had given them the power and the authority to do so. And Jesus even says later when they ask him why we couldn't do it, this required a lot of prayer. These are all part of our, our walk with God that we have the privilege to read His Word and the privilege to come to Him in prayer that we can face any circumstance so that whatever circumstance that I'm in, I can know that I am content and that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I don't have to know how God is using this. I just know that He is and that He loves me. God will bring about His will and He will use people to do that. Whether He uses you or not, or whether you cause other people to stumble, is up to you. It's better for you to cut off your hand or pluck out your eye than to be thrown into hell. Then we have those other verses that I read. Everyone will be salted with fire. Whatever you want that to mean. That's a different sermon. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can we make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Okay, how is the easiest way to make salt unsalty? It's a chemical composition. You can change the composition, do all kinds of things, but I'm not talking about chemistry. The easiest way to make salt less salty is to dilute it. Period. And he tells his disciples here to have salt among you. He's not talking about physical again. And be at peace with each other so that you can season each other, preserve each other, give each other the words of life. We have to have one another. We can't do this alone. We are the body of Christ. That's why the Spirit gives some gifts here and some gifts there. We're all tied together. Salt, back in Jesus' day, was as valuable as gold. And it has been throughout history. There's been plenty of wars salt on gold. It's been used as currency and everything else because of the different properties that it has. The primary way, though, that salt loses its saltiness is to be diluted. Hezekiah cleared the land of the idols and the Asherah poles, but he forgot to clear his own heart, and he was diluted and led the people in a diluted way of worshiping God to the point where God sent his own en enemies there to, to make him repent. Do you need to repent of anything? What's it going to take? All God wants to do is bring you into His loving arms and take you all the way to heaven and create in you the masterpiece that He planned from all, of, all the beginning of time. So I'm going to go back and close with these verses. Isaiah 7 verse 3 said, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to your son Sher Jasib to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the, at the upper pool on the road to the launder's field. Now you get the, my title and everything. Isaiah 36, 2, Then the king of Assyria sent his commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem when the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool at the road at the, to the launderer's field. And I'm going to tell you about Malachi 3, which I read in the scriptures. Verse 2, But who can endure the day of his coming? We're going to face all these things on that way road of holiness. But which ones are we going to listen to, God or someone else? <clears throat> who can endure the day of His coming? Who can stand when He appears? No one. No one. For He will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Thank God for His Son, Jesus Christ. Who will refine me and take out all the impurities and who will wash me clean 
cleaner than any launderer's soap could ever make me. And these trials and things that I don't want to happen in my life, I can face them in one direction or I can face them in another direction. The only direction to face them is trusting in God, praying and seeking His will. I don't have to understand it at all. I don't have to enjoy it, anything else. And I'm thinking back to Joseph, and I'm thinking of Hezekiah, and I'm thinking of Paul and all these other examples because I know that this road leads me to living water for all eternity and that my robes have been washed and He's purifying me along the way as long as I stay on that path and trust in my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Will you put your trust and faith in Jesus and in nothing else? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are such a mighty, wonderful God. We pray for this sinful, fallen world that we live in. Help us to live as aliens and foreigners, Lord, to live by faith. Increase our faith, Father. We thank you for Jesus and His words and that, that the Spirit has come to dwell in us and will write these words upon our heart. Help us not to not to deny you, but to live for you. Give us the strength and increase our faith, Father. Finish in us the work that you have started. Create in us a new heart that serves you, seeks your word, Father, that we become the masterpieces that you have created us to be. Help us to quit kicking against the goads, but to walk by faith, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And we pray that in his precious name. Amen.